Well, welcome everybody. Welcome back to uh, Sawyer Pals and Oars Live. Once again, it's a beautiful spring day here in Southern Oregon. Raining, snowing, sunshine, a little bit of everything. So uh, typical weather for, for Southern Oregon and probably similar to where you're at as well. But uh, today we are actually going to uh, talk about dory drift boats and uh, dory boats in mainly in the Grand Canyon and some of the history of boats. And um, Aaron Stone has joined me with this interview as well because uh, he pretty much covers kind of the Four Corners area. And our guest that I'll let uh, introduce himself is uh, Andy Hutchinson. And Andy, go ahead and give us a little bit about yourself. Hi gang, yeah, glad to be here. Um, yeah, I've uh, been, uh, I'm a Colorado boy. Uh, my my roots are on the Arkansas River over on the eastern slope. I uh, grew up in a little town called Salida. That's a whitewater town, big whitewater town nowadays. Uh, not so much in, when I was a kid, but um, kayak races and you name it and great stretches of whitewater. I, now, I work out of Dolores, Colorado now, which is near the Four Corners, and uh, it's a nice small town. A river runs through it, the Dolores River. We've actually, spring runoff is happening here, and I've uh, floated my drift boat up there um, a couple of times. It's a nice little daily stretch you can do. It's class two, um, kind of royally right now, but it turns into good fishing, kind of wade fishing later on in the summer. Uh, and I'm also close to... Uh, uh, one of my other favorite rivers, which is the Colorado River, uh, west of here. I still guide in Grand Canyon, and um, I just became interested in dories on my very first uh, private trip in 82. I was down there with some friends on a private trip kayaking and saw some dories on the river. It was Martin Litton's uh, uh, dories, um, and I prior to the trip, I'd read this book called uh, the Hidden Canyon, uh, which is a photo essay. John Blaustein, which was an early Martin Litton boatman, a uh, good photographer, did the photos and, and Edward Abbey wrote the text for it as journal form. And that really mm -hmm. influenced me. You know, I'd read um, Desert Solitaire and the, the Monkey Wrench Gang and um, prior to this Grand Canyon trip, which was a dream trip for a lot of boaters. Everyone talks about, yeah, I'm gonna go. and um i definitely fell into that or they so, say once uh, you you just dream about going and once you go you just keep trying to figure out how you're going to get back right exactly yeah yeah um yeah this other influential guy milt wiley who started a whitewater store over in durango it, it used to be four corners marine it's now four corners river sports um Absolutely. his i loved his saying he used to say uh the grand canyon is the trip of a lifetime one should do at least once a year <laughs> so <laughs> that's the goal for everybody yeah if you can get down there um there but the one thing led to another with the dories and uh, a friend daryl stewart who's now um passed away um showed me uh when i decided i wanted to try a boat build showed me how to build boats in stitch and glue form um, and Gerald was kind of involved in, in Grand Canyon boats too. And, uh, there were, there was a connection there with, with Grand Canyon dories, which Martin Litton and the whole story that ties in with that, how Martin found these Oregon boats and brought them to the, the rivers of the Southwest down here. Um, the main boat ended up being, um, what's commonly known down here as the Briggs boat. Um, and up in Oregon, kind of a household name, I guess, on rivers is Jerry Briggs, uh, who passed away Absolutely. a year ago, Absolutely. sadly. But um, Martin found Jerry after he had uh, ordered some other boats from another boat builder up there, uh, Keith Steele. Keith had built Martin at least three boats. Uh, we've got some pictures here to show you guys of those early, early Keith Steele boats. Martin liked the boats, ordered some more, went to pick them up, and Keith hadn't even started them. So, um, and there, there's one of them there, there was one of, that's one of three. I now have this boat. It was donated to me to, uh, for restoration. So that's on my list. Uh, I'm going to try to ta uh, dive into that project, uh, late in this fall. Um, so doing, also, uh, doing a full refurbish. Yeah, that's, that's one, uh, the Hetch Hetchy, my friend, Brad Dimmick, uh, Fretwater Boatworks, uh, restored. 
we actually went up to uh, Victor, Idaho and picked these boats up about a year and a half ago together. Uh, there's an old boat builder guy up there. Uh, uh, they were kind of donated. They came down from Lewiston, Idaho, and they'd been sitting in the boat yard up there, kind of retired. But uh, they're great boats. They're, they're the same length as a Briggs uh, center right. line, which right. is the measurement from the bow stem back to the transom there. And um, they're, they're of what we call McKenzie origin. And so the McKenzie boats, uh, that, that's probably more common up in the Oregon neck of the woods in Idaho, Montana is a, short, a bit shorter boat with a fully rockered uh, profile on the, on the floor. So they, they spin more easily. Uh, what Keith right. did for these Martin boats was he stretched them out about a foot. And um, that's what Martin wanted. He wanted deck space, he wanted storage. He was supplying these two week trips in Grand Canyon with all the stuff and sleeping gear and trying to cram them all in these boats. Um, yeah. And um, Keith, Keith was kind of, the, it was an evolutionary boat until the Briggs boats came along and uh, that became the preferred boat with the boatmen. And that's what really caught my eye. So I, yeah. I'm still, yeah. when people order plans from me or want a custom built boat, I really steer them towards that boat because it's um, it's really a, a has become a boat, whitewater dory wise that everyone compares uh, other I mean, boats to. What about the Briggs boat is I mean, puts it above other boats. I mean, yeah. The the I think the main thing is if if you compare shapes to these boats, if you look at a side profile. Uh, what was different about the Briggs boats, um, they grew up on the Rogue River, of course, and uh, there, there's a great shot right there. Um, the, the bottom cut on a Briggs boat ha has a flat section. Uh, some builders will say that's about six feet, but I've noticed there's a subtle rocker that starts after about four feet at midships, right, which is where the oarlocks are, before the rocker starts. Uh, if you look at a McKinsey boat, which is sitting on top of a Briggs boat in this picture on this trailer, uh, you can see the boat shorter, and you, it's hard to see the full rocker on a McKinsey, but a McKinsey's fully rockered. The, the oars oh. are hiding, hiding that shape. And then now on top of that, that's a new design. It's kind of a scale down um, the tickaboo there, or peekaboo actually. It's what we call dory axe, and my friend Brad is developing that. It's sort of a variation. On, it's a hard haul version of these um, uh, little inflatables you're seeing nowadays um, um oh yeah the whole small boat uh yep the, the small boat wave is, is coming on in, in every type of floatable craft it yeah, seems like. so this is the hard hull um divisions uh you know bounce back on that like okay we can do that in a hard hull boat watch this and it, what what they're great because they're wide they have a wider profile they're stable there's been a couple that have gone down the Grand Canyon already, and um, this was a trip, test trip we did last fall in Westwater Canyon, the upper Colorado, and the boat did great. Um, anyway. Um, yeah. but Andy, let me remind folks here, um, we, we are live, and if you have any comments or questions for Andy, um, definitely put them, in the, put them in the comments there. We do have Derek actually monitoring, so we can get to a lot of your questions, and if uh, you have any detailed pieces um, definitely put those comments in there and uh, we'll keep this all going um, just to keep things kind of moving on let's let's dive into uh, I know we've got a series of photos of kind of that that build of of the uh, of the dory boat and um, let's go into that and then maybe we'll uh, come out of that we'll go into really just these two different ties of the, the dory boats and and the drift boats in the west here and uh, as we discovered, there's uh, quite a few uh, common folks that we, uh, we all know in, in the different areas. So uh, let's kind of move on to that. Maybe let's uh, go right into kind of lead us into the boat build. And, um, and then Shishka can pop up some of those photos as we kind of work our way through there and uh, yep. take it from there. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, essentially, uh, my boat builds uh, and just involve tracing out a pattern, which has been traced off of an old Briggs boat, typically, um, and uh, trace it onto to some scarf pieces of plywood. Uh, you, you add a bow post to that that's ripped out with of hardwood and a transom, or you can build a double ender, you know, pointed at both ends. 
um, start adding bulkheads and you establish the rocker. You can freeform build a boat in this style. Uh, I now have a jig that was actually built around my old Briggs boat. It, it was built by Jerry Briggs. Uh, I think we've got some photos we can show of um, the boats uh, on a rogue trip that we did. Uh, but um, this is actually a McKinsey boat that I had in my shop last winter. But in the background of this photo, you can see the jig. It kind of looks like a whale carcass on a beach. But it, it's yeah. a female mold. And you, you take these scarf panels and you set them uh, uh, temporarily attach them to the sides of that mold and then you fiberglass and stitch everything together with via filleting and seam tape add bulkheads and then build your decks from there and then from there the the boat is winched out of that jig you take the jig away flip the boat over glass the outside and then uh, basically the finishing is cutting out the hatches and uh, building landings for rain drains uh, rain gutters we call them uh, adding gunnels and and then all the hardware. This particular boat that, that we're looking, pic, uh, looking at pictures of here is a McKinsey um, shaped boat, the classic, what we call Woody Heinemann double ender with transom. Uh, center line length from transom to bow post on a boat like that is about 14 feet, 10 inches uh, in measurement. Although I think in Oregon they measure the shear, which is the gun, the upper rail line, and so that ends up. I think they're called commonly called a 16 foot boat, uh, but down here we call them a 14 and a half. Um, well, di different different regions. Um, Was uh, this boat actually originally a an open boat, and then you decked it? Correct. Or yeah. Got yeah, this, uh, the client found this boat from a, another guy that built it actually here in Colorado uh, from a kit. Uh, Don Hill, that's uh, Don Hill offered offered yeah. kits for years, probably still does. Still do. Oh yeah, yeah, up in Eugene. Up in Eugene, right. So this is from one of the Don Hill kit boats and, um, you know, where you build the whole ribs and, and attach the side panels, the plywood to the frames and the ribs on the outside. and. Um, you know, you can you can build a drift boat pretty quickly that way. Now, when you start adding decks, it's a whole nother level of uh, time. <laughs> but uh, you add bulkheads, and that. So my project was to add bulkheads and add decks and uh, compartmentalize the boat. The guy wants to take it on some whitewater float trips. Um, yeah, when when he brought the boat into the shop, it was set for set up for fly fishing. It had the knee hooks in the front for casting and the floorboards. Right, right. And the anchor system and the whole thing. And I he asked me to remove that. So it became quite an involved project. Here we're getting pretty close. Uh, I've done the first coat of paint on the decks after finishing everything, and um, done some no slip uh, paint, and then I'll put a final coat on the boat. Um, I think there's one more shot. There's a side, a good side profile view of that boat um, on my, that's how I roll the boats in my shop. But you can see the full rocker on the bottom. Uh, and that's a classic McKenzie shape right there. Um, right. Oh, yeah. And I'm getting ready to roll the boat and do some bottom work on it. Um, I actually didn't paint the outside. He was kind of on a budget. He wants to do that himself. So he, he's going to pick the boat up and take it home when this COVID thing clears and he can travel up and get the boat. But right. it's, still <laughs> it's crazy, but yeah, still sitting out in my yard right now. Um, gotcha, gotcha. And but, is there, is there, um, do you put a lot of um, just uh, detail into how, how different compartments are as far as like thinking forward of how you're going to put the weight in the boat for whitewater? Or yeah. is it fairly specked out? No, it's uh, a lot of it's based on history, you know, but uh, you do really want to factor that in where your bulkheads go. Some on this particular boat, we have a, a, a sort of a double stern hatch zone. Um, the, the one closest to the transom there um, uh, is the stern stern hatch, and he can put a lot of stuff in there. And, and um, the next hatch forward is where the boatman seat goes, um, and that's uh, in Briggs boats or in Grand Canyon boats, we call that the rear cross hatch. Uh, then you go forward from there, you have the two side hatches, that's sort of the boatman's office, so to speak. You have your personal gear there and beer and all the necessities. 
right. front cross hatch uh, in front of that, more storage. You can put a guitar and, you know, stuff in there, crates, uh, you name it. And then, of course, a bow hatch for, for uh, guests. Um, a lot of the Grand Canyon uh, interior designs have a rear bench, too. Um, and this boat is decked over. It doesn't have that rear bench. So to kind of follow up with your comment about, you know, designing them for packing, Zach, um, yeah, you don't uh, really want to, you, you want to make sure, you want to be conscious of not putting too much weight in the stern part of the boat. That's, you know, right. in, in really big white water, you can get stopped and back surfed, and that's when the boats tend to invert, when they <laughs> pick right. <down> back <laughs> right. and pirouette over. So right. uh, you just, it's that's much more, easier to follow the nose than uh, being yes. shoved down the river. Absolutely, yeah. Right, I got that's you. A, yeah, that that was a fun project. I I have another white uh, whitewater boat right now in my shop that was built by a guy up in Moab. Kind of a it's a nice looking boat. It's it's probably thirty years old, but um, I've been getting a lot of those restoration projects lately. People finding these old boats, you know, they're kind of affordable, and then they kind of dive into them. They think, oh, I can restore it myself, but then they look at how much work is involved, and it might be specialty tools. Um, right. And, uh, but yeah, um, finally they just say uncle and call me and I'm, <laughs> oh, okay. You know, and then I, we talked a little bit about um, that you also provide plans for both. So you sell somebody plans for them to do the build themselves. Um, talk a little bit about that. And then um, have you had a situation where you've sell, sent somebody up the plans and then they say uncle, like they get... <laughs> The, the reality get most of the way into it. that's a that's a good question um not necessarily but it, it's funny you know I, inc I included in my plans you know i provide these full full paper patterns and then like a 25 page booklet i call them cowboy plans they're kind of there's they're not in cad form you know they're just kind of sketched out with all the bulkhead dimension right. um how to do stitch and glue and how to shape the boat but um I also include email consulting and some people I never hear from once I send the plans off and other people, um, they have a lot of questions, you know, <laughs> so might be an too. I may have, may have should have provided more information, but I think it depends on your, your background. You know, some people have built surfboards or kayaks or strip canoes, right. you know, they have some fiberglass or epoxy or wood experience. So it, it depends um yeah but it but it's fun it's it's a just another fun way to connect with folks you know and helping them out with with their dream uh, a lot of people have seen these boats for years and um they're getting a little older and maybe they don't fit in their kayak so well anymore and um they want to try one of these boats out or they have a and they finally the grand canyon private trip finally came up and oh my gosh i i want to take it i want to go in my dream boat so um, right. I remember. Uh, I remember when we went down the Grand after the trip. I think I saw some place that you could you could rent dories, and I don't know if that really still exists. But uh, we we just got off the trip, and you know we're all just completely in a buzz of going down the Grand, and and then we're like on our day before we all start heading home, and somebody's looking at some local paper and is like, "Hey, look, we could have rented dories to take with us." <laughs> it's like oh yeah. we should have had one of those for sure right yeah you know a, an old friend colleague um he's passed away now too this guy his nickname was jelly roll um john baker um worked for one of the companies down there and he tried it he he actually had a luma weld up there in oregon make him uh, he could just built him one boat you know he invested in one boat it was a probably a 16 foot double ender um with the grand canyon style decks and everything and uh, i think he called it the dory connection he had a name and a little website and right. he just had terrible luck with that and, and it was like aaron was talking about you know with plans these people these people would start on these trips and then suddenly the park service would get a sat phone call like we flipped in the first rapid and we're in over our heads we're, we're abandoning the boat and so um and that happened two or three times to where the boat started looking like a worried beer can every time it was rescued. 
Um, and oh, and so right. Jelly Roll sort of abandoned that plan. Yeah. Um, well, let's uh, let's take us and um, kind of bridge the gap to kind of the McKinsey River style drift boat and kind of the boats that um, really kind of began with the Jerry Briggs models and um, kind of take us into those two different areas because really kind of the drift boat, you're not necessarily taking a lot of gear. You know, the dory, you're obviously filling up with quite a bit of gear. And we yeah. talked a little bit about like on the middle fork of the salmon, they have the sweep boats, so they keep their boats fairly light and you'd want to keep your boat light for a lot of that technical navigation. But um, let's, let's kind of compare the two and tie it into kind of the, the time you guys came out here to, to the Rogue and um, kind of how that came about. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting um, how, you know, we, uh, Jerry Briggs is really a, and Dory World down here in the Southwest, he's, a, he's definitely a household name if, once you get sucked into the dory vortex, it's like Briggs boat, Briggs boat, Briggs boat, you know, but um, we, uh, through my friend, uh, friend Brad Dimmick, who's a historian and a boat builder as well. And um, we, we put these kind of tributary trips together. Um, and uh, we, our ultimate dream was to bring, we've got these clients that we take all over the Southwest. We'll do the Yampa one year, we'll do the San Juan. We did a Grand Canyon trip last year. Um, we'll do uh, Cataract Canyon one year. Uh, but in 2016, we went up to the Rogue and brought these old boats that Jerry had built. And that, that was kind of, you know, there's several boatmen out there that inherited these boats in various forms. Um, I have one of them. and. Uh, Anyway, we ended up there with six of them, and we made an arrangement to, to uh, meet Jerry, um, have him come down and see the boats, and our passengers met him uh, on this trip that we did from uh, Grants Pass all the way down to Gold Beach. We went all the way to the ocean. And just, I think we have a photo of that. Yeah, that was uh, the day two. We started in Grants Pass and floated down to Morrison's. You know, we're still above the wilderness section here, but... Uh, <laughs> That's a great shot. Um, and uh, Jerry came down. There he is in, in his uh, Levi's and suspenders. And um, um, these most of the boatmen on this that went with us on this trip um, were longtime Grand Canyon boatmen um, that worked, in, you know, at various years um, rowing rowing these boats and getting to know these boats. So. Uh, I just remember when we left the beach and Jerry was still standing there staring at us, we all just broke into tears. It was pretty emotional. And, um, you know, I, I think Jerry just, he loved, he built like 36 of these boats for Martin over the years. And the boatman just fell in love with him and, and uh, took care of him. And um, there's another, another shot of him at that beach. Uh, uh, Martin Litton, who started Grand Canyon Dories, he kind of started the, the company by accident. He wasn't really a good businessman, but he wanted to show the folks um, the Grand Canyon in an elegant, eloquent way uh, in, in these type of boats. Um, and um, after the key steel order fell through, he driving down the road, he just literally discovered Jerry, uh, drove to his... Uh, shop there in, in Grants Pass. He might have met him at a, a, a boat trade show or two. You know, there might have been another connection. Right, right. Uh, Jerry said, sure, we'll make you the Rogue River special and um, we'll deck, deck it over for you. And and here's a picture of um, the boat that went with us on that trip. And that that's the Rogue River special right there. It's the same boat, except it's, it right. has a different transom, obviously. Um, the, the, the Rogue River Specials have a drop-off transom to allow for a tiller motor, you know, for when they motor out from rogue trips. But right. um, the beauty of the Rogue River boat, again, is, uh, or the Rogue River Special, is that flat spot at midships. And then they also have a larger, taller bow. They have more cheek, we call it, uh, deflects water better. And uh, I think the Rogue River, it's a pool drop river. It's more analogous to the Colorado uh, versus... Right. Shallower, you know, rivers up north like the McKenzie and uh, the Deschutes, maybe rivers like that. Um, yeah, I always noticed, you know, there there was a couple guys on the fishing crew that had the Rogue River Specials. Billy and and Brett especially would only have those boats, and um, 
you know, there was always a couple Aluma Wells, a couple Willie boats on there. And, you know, the Rogue River specials were a good, a good foot and a half longer. Yeah. But they were still able to, to navigate. And, um, and then when you got in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the flat water, the, those boats just would track so much yeah. smoother than, than any of the shorter boats that would, that we were running. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the main thing that that trackability or that that flat section midships uh, just it's like a creates it's it's a keel effect for sure, um, and so it makes them better to row in flat water, easier. They track better, um, but they still there's still great maneuverability in there that uh, in white water, right, you know, right. even if it, even these big overloaded Grand Canyon freighters we call them they. <laughs> they still perform it's it's just amazing it, um you know we we really you know jerry briggs is really on to something there so all these boats that have sort of evolved from that they some some idaho boat builders like the wider floors uh, my friend brad Demick is is doing that now um as well uh in, in flagstaff um designing wider bottomed boats um uh, for more, more the, the middle fork type application yeah. right yeah exactly more stability and you can you can still upstream ferry and row around stuff um you know grand canyon we tend to downstream ferry more just because there's it's bigger water and there's a uh, deeper channel but um um yeah um we still everything is still comes back to the the center point of comparison of the briggs boat the that uh, originated in um, Grants Pass there. Um, and I think that the Rogue River Special was really Jerry's design. I think he picked up some pointers from his dad. Um, right, right. Um, Squeak is how it's written in the journals that the lodge is on the Rogue. Squeak Briggs. Um, but Jerry really learned it from um, his dad. And then there was another guy, George Hood, that he built a boat for. Uh, I don't know where that boat went, but uh, Jerry bought that boat back, the original first boat that he built um, from George Hood, it was, um, or from another owner. But um, yeah, that's that's the roots right there, Grants Pass. So right. does there, you know, so basically out in, in this area, you know, in the Southern Oregon area, there's a lot of, there's a lot of aluminum boat manufacturers and, yeah. uh, you know, and Willie Boats and, and Pavati Boats and Aluminum Bulb was based here, Fish Right was here, you know, but um, as far as the dories, are there, are there actual companies that are making aluminum dories or is that kind of not really? Yeah, Eddie Line. Yeah, Eddie Line's yeah. making an aluminum deck dory. Eddie Line is making a great boat right now. He's made several uh, and the guy's brilliant. Yeah. Mike Dehoff in uh, Moab, Utah. Um, gotcha. yeah, he's playing with that wider boat. He 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 finished a boat he called the Chub recently. Yep. Uh, the, you know the boat looks good, and generally, if it looks good, it's probably going to row good. Um, and now he's working on an even wider boat. As is Brad. We all kind of collaborate. You know, we email each other, and um, I'm kind of more of Renaissance traditional. Uh, I like my old 48 inch wide Briggs boat. It just goes like a narrow and I'm totally happy with that boat. I can use it commercially and privately. And, um, but, um, yeah, so that, so Eddie line welding. And then, um, I, I don't know if anyone up in Oregon is building a whitewater version of, of, um, of the boats anymore, like Luma weld was doing, but, um, right, right. um, but yeah, yeah, there's some shots of some of the of the Aluma well boats. Um, I think right. these, um, and some were made, built for uh, oars, or some have been refurbished. You know, there there was a point when Jerry Briggs stopped building wood boats, and so they went to Aluma Weld. They designed a bit wider boat, uh, uh, and there was there was several of those boats made. That's that's kind of the boat that I learned in commercially when I started in Grand Canyon was an Aluma Weld Briggs, uh, 54 inch wide floor, about a foot longer center line. They measure about 17, nine or 18 feet. Right, uh, right. Um, and then, and so that like out here, most, most of the drift boats are, you know, are not decked. And uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, how, 
how you can you're really kind of approaching it like a canoe it's a whitewater canoeist would because you're really trying to stay out right. of swamping but um talk a little bit about that difference in the dory where you have passengers and you know, you're really just trying to not as much worried about the amount of water but you don't want to go upside down yeah 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 no it's um yeah you're not you're not going for that magic eddy that has you know um the biggest steel head you've ever seen in your life it's more you don't want to swim anyone i mean a lot of our clients and guides included don't really want to swim anymore so you're you're trying to keep the boat upright so you coach people on um on uh, you know the common term is high side we all know about that whitewater boaters throwing your weight uh if if you lose an oar and a boat goes up sideways on a wave um you can keep the boat from going over so that's part of the dynamics and the fun of um uh like especially on a two-week say grand canyon trip where you have time to orient people um there's a, some big rapids early on that that kind of give everyone a slap in the face and a wake-up call and then you get some mellow time to enjoy the canyon and the geology and then you reach the inner gorge and then it's game on it's like we're not going to talk about hiking you know you can take pictures <laughs> of the rapids, but we're we're whitewater focused um you know the boatmen sort of go into that gunfighter focus for a while and then it mellows right, out again, right. and then you, then everyone's ready for the climax, which is lava falls. Um, and um, yeah, as far as uh, we're very conscious about loading the boats properly nowadays, we have these big dory trailers that we we pretty much load them um, meticulously in the warehouse, and then they're put on the trailer. They're fully loaded, so it's great when we get to the river. Uh, we put them in the water and we're ready for the bus to arrive to, with our folks. Um, we are conscious about weight. We, um, w the boats run better with you know, the heavier people. We don't have a scale there, but um, the heavier people. A little have, more weight in the bow. And a little more weight in the bow, a little more punching power. Um, right. Lighter sterns helps um, with, with the, the loading of those boats. And then, of course, um, some boats have gone to these bilge systems now you know we're a we're a self-bailing conscious society nowadays in the in the whitewater but um in grand canyon you know it is a pool drop river and so we we still coach people we have bailing buckets and do it the old-fashioned way and and they get into right. it um the water's cold down there it's tail water from glen canyon dam so the longer you sit in that water the colder you get so that more, uh, a little more. bailing keeps them moving yeah exactly mm -hmm. so yeah that's kind of the the main the main difference it's you know with with whitewater boating and so like or, we, we talked a little bit about you know how the middle fork you know, they have the sweep boats that are really hauling all this gear is it yeah. pretty common that most dory trips on the grand basically there isn't there isn't another there's not a rubber boat there's they're all just you carrying all the gear with you or is there actually a supply boat that there there's supply as well? yeah it depends on the company if you say go with oars uh which uh, they bought out grand canyon dories years ago they have a lot of those old boats um are still running have been restored they typically uh most trips that i'm on with those guys uh they'll bring three 18 foot rafts um self-bailing rafts which one one's a toilet boat kind of and there's some cooler boats and a veggie boat and a um a meat boat so uh gotta have a few barges yeah i gotta have a few barges so that's that's oars procedure um the, the other company that i've mainly worked for over the years grand canyon expeditions based out of on the north side of grand canyon canab um they br bring a big old s rig with them which is a 37 foot pontoon motorized boat um oh, which kind of okay. contradicts the whole aesthetics of dories you know when when you look at it in one way but it's very practical um that doesn't mean that dories don't have anything in and we load that we still load those things to the density of a neutron star i mean you're, you're just cramming every corner right so if we just bring a lot more gear on the river nowadays but um 
you know, the, the S rig is safe if you have a, a certain person that doesn't feel like riding through a certain rapid, you know, you've got that safety. But for the most part, it's just very efficient. All the tables and toilet system goes on there. Right, They're right. Duffel. Yeah, whitewater boaters were not really known for skimping on anything. No, no, it's, uh, yeah, really not backpacker style so much anymore or right. self-support. Um, yeah. So if somebody was wanting to, you know, get that they really wanted to row a dory down the Grand, and that was their goal. And but they had rowed some drift boats around, and they've rowed some rivers. Are there are there folks that actually take people out and and teach them some of the finer points of big water dory boating, or is that just kind of more of a if you if you want to go for it, you go for it. No, uh, you just kind of, uh, as far as Grand Canyon goes, you just kind of uh, go for it. And, you know, we, we get a, a number of guests that they might have grown up on water, you know, like East Coast, right. West Coast. They might even have a, a beautiful Grand Bank story or, or a nice, you know, they've been rowing uh, racing skulls their whole life and they know how to row and they want to row and you let them row. It's great. But, um, um, and they can try out some ripples, you know, I mean, they've, they pay a, pay a pretty good fare to go on one of these trips. So, um, you, you don't want to, um, get behind schedule, you know, so that's right, right, right. before where people want to just keep rowing. No, I'm, I got this. I'm going to figure this out. And meanwhile, the rest of the boats are two miles ahead of you, but you know, that's just the nature of, of boats. Um, I think. I think oars, uh, I don't know if they were still doing that, but they were offering on the main salmon, at least a couple of years ago, they were offering a, a little dory school where you go and you right. get to construction, you learn how to pack the boats, load them, unload them, how to park, where to park, don't park them in the rocks, um, choose your camp carefully, and all right. the you know, little idiosyncrasies that go with these um, hard hull so boats. So where... where where do the new Dory guides come from? You know, I mean, the Dory guides, that's like the, the pristine, you know, that everybody wants to be the Dory guide. But, I mean, do you get people that were, you know, they were running rafts for years and then they just kind of got to a point where they want to, they wait to get their foot in the door? Or is it, uh, is it more somebody who's been running drift boats in, like with a middle fork drift boat, person have a chance to get on yeah. and train with a Grand Canyon Dory type yeah, operation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, I think that, that that's a good approach. Um, and you really have to like the boats to begin with. You know, if, like Martin Litton said, if you have to ask why a Dory, uh, you'll never know the answer, you know, no matter what kind of <laughs> um, response you get. But um, yeah. Some people are just drawn to them. Some boatmen that have 300 trips down there just still look at them and go, those are impractical. Those are stupid boats. You know, you have to put them on a trailer and you have to, they're, they're always complaining about scratching your boat. Well, when you get back to the warehouse and you have to repaint it, it's, um, you have to factor all that stuff in. But right. for the most part, uh, to answer your question, um, for Oars, at Oars, for example, the company Oars, um, in Grand Canyon and other stretches, they do do offer dory trips. Um, it's the, the baggage, people rowing baggage on those trips that become really interested in that. That's a really good training source. You can, you can trade off on certain days. Um, let, let the baggage boatman row your boat a bit or a boat if, um, right. and, um, if, if they've, if they've got the gumption, if they, they've got the will, um, you know, they might have to row eight or 10 baggage trips and um, to, to get a slot, you know, and it might be four or five years, but right. it just depends on your background experience. Say if you have middle fork experience or you rode out in California on some Nar Nar rivers, you know, some class four stuff, I think you might fast track a little bit more. I, I think that the technical skills of kayaking included, you know, and running paddle boats, I think. It, right um yeah having more, that having yeah. that just the ability to read the river and and that's that becomes more heightened probably but i mean i know yeah. on the on the lower rogue you know there's there's at times there's definitely shortage of canyon drift boat guides 
because sure. there are not as many of those as say whitewater canyon guides and yeah. um and so there's definitely companies that are actively trying to pursue you know guides that are running raft trips in the summertime to get them to run drift boat trips in the fall and is there is it that same kind of culture in in dory companies as far as are they always kind of looking at you know where are we going to get those next couple guys that can that can run the dory trips or is it just kind of like we've got there's enough there's enough old timers that keep filling it in and there's never a shortage yeah so there you really think there's companies that are kind of going where is our next uh dory guide coming from yeah, no, they're they're really it's it's uh, climbing the ladder, you know. There, there's a pretty good uh, group of say twenty somethings out there tugging on the coattails right now that I've noticed, and uh, women included. You know, there's a lot more. Right. Um, uh, and it's it's not just the ability to row them. I mean, women boatmen kick ass. You know, um, uh, do really well. At, um, I think with whitewater training programs and stuff now, and, and just people are getting a lot more trips in general. And so, uh, but that's just one dynamic. The other is packing, packing the boats and taking care of them. And, and, uh, can you fix it if you wreck it? Right. You know, or, right. <laughs> uh, I mean, you're all, a, you're all a team on a commercial trip. Um, every, everyone's going to help each other out, but, um, no, I think I think that baggage boat program is a good building block that I've noticed. And um, if if you have the interest and the gumption, you know, um, you keep bugging. Um, it's not like their out, outfitters are out there, you know, trolling for for new boatmen or, or look, you know, right. looking for there's, a, there's a pretty good lineup waiting list that I, that I've yeah. noticed. I know I know at years at years there's definitely seemed to be bit of a shortage um you know it kind of ebbs and flows but yeah um, you know definitely like really low water years on the rogue is kind of where a lot of the drift boat companies do bring on a baggage boat and that baggage boat person gets to basically watch a lot of what the drift boat lines are and get to see the operation kind of like oh yeah maybe i maybe i'll get into that next next season you know yeah. and once they do yeah. what they do have to have that passion they have to have that drive and kind of like you know, perseverance. That. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably the, the bigger hurdle there is not only do they have to have that drive to run a drift boat, but they also have to have that drive to fish. <laughs> so yes. now that's probably the big difference in the, you know, the whitewater dory is like, you know, that person really loves those whitewater trips. They can actually change over to this different, more pristine craft and still yep. do just whitewater. You know, they don't have to learn how to how to row a dory and how to fish are all the different means so yeah it's probably a little bit more of a barricade on the rogue as well i would say so yeah yeah zen and the art of of fishing that's a lifetime pursuit right there <laughs> yeah exactly uh, all, but there's all of the all the canyon guides always tell you that you can take a whitewater boater and teach them how to fish but you can't take a fisherman or an angler and teach them how to boat you know that's just a bad idea Probably not. Yeah. 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 They're, they're going to be looking for fish, not rocks <laughs> or who knows. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Different focus for sure. Well, well, excellent, Andy. I think, uh, I think we'll start wrapping it up. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. I think we, uh, we yeah. may need to have you back and, uh, you know, we can uh, dive into a few more, uh, pieces. I know you have some, uh, some different, uh, or socket attachments that you uh, produce and various things like that. And uh, maybe we generate some interest for some people that uh, want to want a drift boat kit plan and, uh, you know, you can get some more, more Dory folks out there. And uh, yeah, yeah we just definitely really appreciate it. And uh, we will, uh, we will keep the feed going and we'll see, uh, you know, if we do hit uh, comments or interest on, on what you're doing, uh, we'll definitely send that on your way and uh, it will live forever on the, on YouTube as well, so we'll uh, keep that up as a resource. And uh, Perfect. yeah, I'd like to and then, go back. This this has been fun. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Absolutely, thanks, Zach. absolutely. Yeah, installment absolutely. one. Yeah, installment that's right. One. Part one. Part one.
And uh, everybody out there for joining us, thank you very much for uh, yeah, joining us here on the Sawyer Live once again. And um, we do have a, another um, another live broadcast coming up this Thursday. We'll be talking with uh, Molly and and Kinsley from uh, the Montana Guide Relief Foundation, and uh, see what they're doing. You know, Montana actually is kind of one of the one of the states that started opening a bit earlier than others, and I uh, just heard that they're actually uh, they're lifting their 14-day quarantine before you can go to Montana on June 1st. So uh, we'll see how that affects their uh, their guiding operations. And uh, please stay tuned. And uh, once again, thanks everybody for joining. When you're going through your day, remember be patient, be kind, shop local, and support local shops out there. Get out and explore your backyard. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.